thank you so much for this dinner. Mm, so good. So this is a message I preached at uh, Crossway Church uh, just a couple of hours ago, and it's called Rich People Problems, based on James chapter four, verse thirteen through chapter five, verse six. Rich people problems. So here it is. This is 45-year-old Mariama, also known as Mary, who lost her job as a cleaner when the company closed down due to COVID-19. Uh, so she started selling coconut rice, also known as nasi lemak in Malaysia, for two ringgit each, the equivalent of 40 pence. Uh, on a good day, Mary sells 40 packets, which is 16 pounds, uh, which she uses to support her three children and her mother at home. Today's sermon is called Rich People Problems. And the question is, what problems could a rich person have compared to Mary? You know, what do they know of working 16 hours a day, earning 16 pounds a day to feed four mouths at home? And the answer is, they don't know. And they possibly don't care. Uh, when that happens, the book of James says, we have a big problem with God because he knows and God cares. Three points from today's passage. Rich people plans rich people problems and a poor person's God plans problems God. James chapter four and verse 13. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Now for some reason I hear this and I think a food blogger. <laughs> Uh, this is Gib Ojisan, a YouTuber in Singapore, a travel vlogger. You know, it's not just food vloggers or travel vloggers, but the truth is all of us. All of us make plans every day. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Lawrence, who led music, he had to plan and practice his songs. Vivian, who led the service, she had to plan and organize the service. You know, even Mary, whom we met earlier, the nasi lemak seller, she plans to open her own stall, verse 13, or to carry on business and to make money. So is James saying that that is wrong, that is sinful? Well, verse 14 asks an even more extreme penetrating question. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? Meaning, not just that you don't know whether tomorrow is going to rain or it's going to snow. That's not what he's saying. No, you don't even know whether you will still be alive tomorrow. What is your life, he says. You know, what makes you think that today is not the last day that you and I are going to be alive? And that's kind of like the sense of that question in verse 14. And he also says this, you are a mist that appears for a little while and then it vanishes. You know, he's talking about significance, the significance of your life, how much impact would your life make if you were gone today? Most of my plans are to extend significance, not to extend survival like Mary, you know, she doesn't work, she doesn't eat. But most of my plans, if I'm honest, is to kind of like make myself look good in front of other people. You know, there's a part of me, even in the sermon, that wants you to like this message and to like me, is to like my significance. But James says to me and to you, you are missed. No one's going to remember anything about this message 20 minutes from now, maybe even tomorrow, they'll forget everything. <laughs> but that is a good thing, friends. That's a good thing when we think of ourselves less and start thinking about God more. I am missed, but he is the master. Verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will or the master's will, we will live and do this and do that. Notice that phrase again, we will live and do this and do that. You think of a person with a terminal disease, COVID, or even cancer, they would say this, you know, God, please give me one more day to live. But if you're not ill, if you're healthy, you know, you eat all your vegetables, <laughs> you exercise, what would it take for God to make you say, God, give me one more day. God, if you will, I will live one more day. What would God have to change in your life, in your circumstance, in your plans, for you to admit that we are missed? He is the master. Verses 16 and 17, they pull things together, but they go together because they talk about good and evil. Verse 16, as it is you boast in your arrogant schemes, all such boasting is evil. Verse 17, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. You know, so there's on one hand evil boasting, but on the other hand, good works 
from God. A lot of talk on the one hand, but zero action in verse 17. You boast of all the stuff you're going to get done, but you ignore the good that God wants you to do. Big talk, zero action. Uh, and verse 17 says, if you do this, it is sin for them. Meaning, we might not realize it's sin. We might not get what a big sin this is. Because we are busy, we do lots of stuff, we say we're planning to do all this stuff. And even when we say this in our Bible study group, I am so busy, I have so many things to do at work. Our Bible study group will say, oh, you poor thing, I'm so sorry for intruding on your time. Friends, God will never say to you, I'm sorry for intruding on your schedule. He will give you that appointment, he'll give you that thing to do, and you're not doing it, you're ignoring it, you're doing something else. That is sin for you. It's sin of omission, not commission. Pursuing our own agenda and leaving out God's glory, God's agenda, God's good that he wants us to do. And that's the first point. James says you have this big problem in your plans because they are your plans, not God's. They are your appointments, not God's, God's appointments, God's priorities. But our second point, James says that there's a problem with your wealth, your wealth. Notice chapter five, verse one. Now listen, you rich people weep and wail because of the misery that's coming upon you. Verse two, your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes, your gold and your silver, they are corroded. Now last week, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced a lockdown. You know, and imagine the first thing you did right after you heard that announcement, you went out, you withdrew all your money, all your savings and you bought toilet paper. Reams and reams, mountains and mountains of toilet paper. That is all you have in your house. Meaning the more you have, the more foolish you look, the more you have, the more you are condemned. And that's the sense here in chapter 5. Your wealth, James says, has rotted. It's kind of, you think of it, like rubbish. You look and say rubbish and you see rotting lunch, leftovers. James says, imagine all your wealth has rotting rubbish. Your house, your mansion, that's rubbish. Your clothes, you're wearing rubbish. And even your treasured possessions, your phone, your, instead of clinging onto your phone, you're looking at a piece of rubbish. You're clinging onto it. My precious rubbish. There's actually a scene from the movie Parasite, that South Korean movie this very disturbing scene where this whole house is flooded sewage and it's so disgusting it's so gross and god is saying that is what i see when i see you sitting in your wealth in your luxury comfort in this unused riches verse 3 their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You've hoarded or you've treasured this wealth in the last days. Colonel Sanders, who found KFC, Colonel Sanders, he said this, you know, I have no desire to be the richest person in a cemetery. And James is kind of like saying the same thing to rich people who have lots of wealth. Your wealth is not going to save you. It might even condemn you. A warning to people who have too much, not using their wealth to bless others. But John Calvin very helpfully points out, and he wrote his commentary 500 years ago, he points out that James might not just be talking to rich people, but other people who are envying the rich, who are looking to the rich, who are idolizing the rich, who might even want to be rich. And James might be saying to them, don't just look at that, look to God instead. Verse four, look, the wages you fail to pay the workers who mowed your fields, he's talking to the rich people, they're crying out, against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Essentially saying, I can only say this because I'm a guest speaker at this church. But it's saying to these rich people, these condemned people, you're going to hell. <laughs> I can say that because after this I run away and I don't have to explain it. I think that's the sense, the condemnation of James is bringing upon these rich people who are trusting their riches, you are misusing their riches. You are bringing this judgment upon yourself. And I say this because everything that God hears and everything that God sees says to these rich people, it's negative, it's judgmental. Verse five, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You fatten yourself for the day of slaughter. In other words, you've done this to yourself. Two warnings we see here to the rich. Now I'm gonna include myself in that category and you as well. If you have a computer and you can see this on Facebook or on Zoom, you are in that category of the rich. And two warnings, one is of unused riches and the other is of misused riches. First, unused riches are as good as rubbish. <laughs> you know, we Asians, our instinct is to save and save and save. But in the same way that our unused time in that first section, when we don't use it for God's glory, we don't use it to do what God wants us to do, is sin for us. So in the same way, unused money, unused wealth that God has allocated for his purposes that we don't use towards that end, that too for us is sin. 
That's the first thing, unused riches. But more seriously is this second category of misused, misused riches. And what money essentially is, is a form of power to help you help others or to help you harm the people around you. So when you go to Starbucks and you buy that latte, essentially you're exercising a bit of that power on that person who's making that latte for you. Same with the cleaner at your workplace, same with the IT person on the phone helping you with that problem with your computer. And here's a verse that says that God he hears everything. Not everything you say to them, everything they say about you. Cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. So here's the question. What are your underlings, your employees saying about you? What do they think about you as their boss? Because the way that you treat them ultimately is going to be the way that God treats you and me. More money? more problems. <laughs> That's the name of a song, but it's also our second point. It's saying don't idolize those who are rich because there are problems associated with that wealth. Sins, they're especially associated with having too much wealth. Rich people problems. Finally, a poor man's God. And this is verse six. Verse six is really strange, and, but quite interesting. Verse six, it says, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. What's going on? It's so strange. It's strange because it's saying that someone died. Someone died in this church being killed by these rich people and he didn't oppose them, meaning he didn't fight back. And stranger still, doesn't this person sound a little bit like Jesus, <laughs> the innocent one? Now, obviously we know it's, it's not Jesus. It can't be Jesus, but it still kind of sounds like him. And I think here James intentionally superimposes this Jesus picture of his submission and his trust in God and his, you know, crucifixion on the cross on this innocent, nameless Christian who is poor, but is killed in his church. He superimposes these two characters. Why does he do this? Essentially, James is saying to us, if you're a Christian, expect this to happen to you. The way that they treated Jesus, you know, is the way that they might treat you. And the way that Jesus responded to persecution is the way that we should respond and trust ultimately in God as our final judge. You know, our instinct when we are oppressed, when we are taking advantage of is to boast out <laughs> or to fight back, you know, or, or to make ourselves rich enough and comfortable enough that we will never be in that position of being taken advantage of. That's what we sometimes do for our kids. But you know, here is Jesus saying, you know, life is not a Hong Kong drama. You know, you watch one of those old Hong Kong drama with Man Chi Leong, you know, Man Chi Leong, he starts up poor and he goes into the company, he rises up the rank and then he takes a, he takes his revenge on all those rich people who took advantage of him when he was poor, but he falls in love with the boss's daughter and so he's conflicted. But you know, that's, that's, that's drama. But this is real life, which is saying, James is saying to us, you and me, if we follow Christ, we follow in his footsteps of suffering. And that applies to you whether you're rich or poor. You can never run away from this oppression and suffering which God will allow to seep into our lives. And maybe you know someone in your church who's been through that. What would you say to encourage such a believer? I think James is saying this, God is still your God. He is on your side. He will judge evil with justice. He hears all of your cries or prayers, but know this, God is always with you and God is always for you. And in your faithfulness and in his providence, he has chosen you to display the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ, the likeness of the gospel in your poverty and even in your submission. Today, uh, in the UK, it's Remembrance Sunday. And everywhere you go, in many churches, you hear this tagline, lest we forget, lest we forget. We want to remember them, but we also do this so that we do not forget. And here's an assurance, you know, we might forget. This guy is nameless, but God will never forget. Every tear, every sacrifice, every suffering we go through for his namesake. And everything that God remembers, God will one day repay in full, in both salvation and in both judgment through our Lord Jesus Christ. Plans, problems, and a poor person's God. How shall we summarize this? What would a Christ-centered plan look like? Well, it looks like people who put God in control of their calendar. You and I, we have the same number of hours in a day, but when God is in charge of our lives and in charge of a calendar, life is exciting. 
what does God have in store for us to do that is good, that will benefit other people that we could never even think of? but he's already laid in advance for us to do. Living a Christ-centered, planned life means expecting God to use our lives for his glory and for our good. That's the first thing. Secondly, Christ-centered problems. And you know, there are actually good problems to solve in life that can be solved through riches and through shared wealth and through generosity. And I help out with this uh, volunteer group. Often the problem that we have more volunteers than people who need help, that should be the case in church. More people stepping up, more people offering their wealth, more people offering their time, such that together we are able to do so much that we're just scratching our heads as leaders thinking, how shall we help people who are in need? How can we reach out to the people and offer them this grace, this love, this good news through the Lord Jesus Christ? And that's a good problem to worry about, especially coming up to Christmas. But finally, a poor person's God or a Christ-centered God. Christ reminds us that you don't need to be rich to display the gospel. In fact, oftentimes God uses the most humble, the most you know, lowly circumstances to display his riches and his glory through the gospel. And you might be sitting there in church or you know, stuck in your room thinking, you know, I'm so insignificant, I have nothing to offer. You have your life and you have Christ and God can use you to display the most magnificent glories of the gospel. But he might do that through your suffering, but he will do that through your submission and faith through the Lord Jesus Christ. Plans, problems, and a Christ-centered God. And that's our message. Thank you for listening. Thank you again. <laughs> I need to eat this dinner. Thank you so much to my friends who provided me this. Take care and God bless.